Well, for generations, Canadians were proud to sew the maple leaf on their backpacks and travel the world without their national identity in question. Joining us now as we consider what wearing that flag might mean in today's world, in our nation's capital, Fen Osler Hampson, Distinguished Fellow and Director of the Global Security and Politics Program at the Centre for International Governance Innovation Centre. John Ibbotson, Writer at Large with The Globe and Mail. And here with us in our studio, Supriya Devedi, Consultant with Crestview Strategy. It is a public affairs firm here in our city. Andrew Cohen, Professor of Journalism and International Affairs at Carleton. He's also a columnist with the Ottawa Citizen. And we welcome back John Blackwell and Antigonish, Nova Scotia, and Margaret Beto Lawrence, also in Ottawa. Welcome to all six of you. Thank you. This is going to be a fun debate. Let me begin in Ottawa with our guests on the line. Fenn, let me begin with you. Did the new flag that Canada adopted give us a new sense of nation? I think it, uh, I think it did. I mean, I'm struck by uh, the observations uh, uh, of those who knew uh, the debates at the time, uh, that it was very uh, heated. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that with the passage of time, uh, Pia, um, familiarity uh, has bred uh, a great deal of comfort with, uh, with the flag. Uh, and certainly when I travel and see Canadians, uh, particularly talk to young Canadians, you know, they're very proud of their Canadian identity. Uh, they will have little pins on their knapsacks or on their jackets, uh, you know, to really say, you know, we're Canadian. Uh, we're not something else. We're not British. We're not Americans. John Ibbotson, where are you on this one? The, when the flag is born, do we have this new sense of nation here? Well, I think it was part of a process. I was struck thinking back 50 years ago, how much time we spent agonizing over whether we were in fact a colony of Great Britain or whether we had become simply a colony of the United States. What did it mean to be Canadian? Who were we other than just not Americans? And you fast forward 50 years to the country we have today, which is confident, which is growing, which has a, a strong sense of its place in the world, um, a fabulous multicultural society that is bringing in more people than any other place on earth on a per capita basis, integrating them more successfully than any other place on earth, w wonderful cities that are being rated among the best in the world, especially Toronto and Montreal and Vancouver. Um, and, and a new generation, I think, that has completely put aside all of those old, ancient, tired questions about what Canada is. I think Canadians know emphatically what Canada is today, and I think they're very proud of it. And I think that's, that flag is, is a symbol of that pride. Mm. Andrew. I, I can't disagree with anything I've heard. Um, I do recall, though, in the 70s, the great pride of um, Canadian backpackers sewing that maple leaf on their backpacks. I've heard in recent years that's less so. Not that it's um, without pride, but Canada, as it takes positions in the world, as it, um, for example, went into Afghanistan and other places, which were, of course, the considered view of, of the government, re, uh, duly elected government, that that brought among Canadians a sense of, uh, abroad, a skepticism that perhaps hadn't been there before when we were the peacekeeping nation, mm. uh, or seen to be the peacekeeping nation. So um, all to say that the flag has become that symbol, we're not traditionally a nation of flag wavers but I think we've become more and more and we do bring it out on occasions and it is important to remember Pia that um, what Pearson was doing was part of an affirmation of, of, of Canada that had started in the early 20th century um, 1909 when we when the Department of External Affairs was formed in World War One when the Canada Corps was formed 1931 when the Statue of Westminster allowed us to run our own foreign policy 47 when we got our own citizenship 49 when the Supreme Court became the last court of appeal rather than the British Privy Council Pearson was acutely aware of status nationalism. Mm. And so when 64 comes around, he says one of the unfinished pieces, the last unfinished piece would be the patriation of the Constitution, but the, one of the unfinished pieces was the flag. And it is important to remember today, really, uh, as we've discussed, how vigorous the opposition was and how the Conservatives were on the wrong side of this issue and to this day has still not come to terms with that fully. Okay, we're going to pick up on a bunch of tendrils that, that you sort of laid out there as our conversation moves on. But Priya, let me come to you. When did your folks immigrate to Canada? Did they immigrate here? Yeah, they did. So, I mean, my mother came here to marry my father and my grandfather actually came here in the uh, mid-60s um, okay. as a professor. And as you look back and talk to your family about when, when they first arrived, do you, do you think that 
the, the, the flag at the time gave us a new sense of what it meant to be Canadian. Sure, I think so, but would it have been any different if we had chosen a different flag? I mean, say for maybe the Beatles one, let's say, <laughs> but had we chosen, you know, an, any, any other of those variations with the Maple Leaf, would our Canadian identity have suffered? I, I don't think so. I think we're, we're more than, than a symbol, we're more than a flag, and I think our nationality runs much deeper than that, and I think that's a good thing. Margaret, I mean, I, you have such a close tie to all the, this flag. What is your sense of what happened in, you know, when that flag was first raised on Parliament Hill? Did it, you know, redefine Canada? Well, I don't know that it redefined Canada, but it certainly gave us our own distinct identity uh, that separated us, that gave us that one extra step away from, you know, empire and, and dominion. Um, I think it, it's been a, it was part of a process, um, and I agree with what has been said, that, that Canada has has matured. I think that maturing process began before 1964 and proceeded on right through. I mean, I remember when I was in school in the 70s and 80s, uh, in you know, high school and university, that the, the big thing was Canada was a middle power. And, uh, you know, I think that, that concept has become outdated now. Uh, we, we've gone way beyond being a middle power, whatever that was actually supposed to mean. Well, Mar Margaret touched on this. I mean, here, there's Diefenbaker. He's scared. He has fears that a new flag would break from what he saw as this great, glorious, imperial past. Was he right to have those fears? Yesterday, I was invited to a, a local school, and, and I gave a little talk about the flag to school kids. And one of the thing I, things I did was to play the clip of the lowering of the red ensign and the raising of the Maple Leaf flag on Parliament Hill for the first time. And it was an extremely somber affair. There were 10,000 people there. It was freezing cold. It was noon. And John Diefenbaker shed tears, as probably others did. John Diefenbaker um, was a, a devout Anglophile, ironically a German-Canadian. Um, but the amazing, and, and I, I must tell you also that Prior to that event, George Stanley received a death threat through the uh, RCMP. Uh, this person said that if you if you've killed our old flag, so you need to be killed. Um, he was a defiant Albertan, and he wore his Hudson's Bay coat to the ceremony and stood out like a sore thumb in the uh, in the middle of this formal dark attire. But George was, was interviewed in 1995, and he said, give it a generation. I, I predicted, give it a generation, and it will be totally accepted. And he was absolutely right. I, I spoke with a, 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 a retired uh, army officer from Vancouver a couple of days ago. And he said in the summer of 1967, he took the train from Vancouver to Winnipeg, and all across Every small community was 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 flying crisp new uh, maple leaf flags and celebrating the centennial of Canadian Confederation. All right, I want to read something. This is uh, from the National Post, printed a couple of years ago, and it, it sort of moves us through what what the motivations of our politicians may or may not have been at the time. Here we go. It's a long quote. Here we go. In the 1960s, in, inspired by the spirit of the times, Pierre Elliott Trudeau and his merry band of sorcerer's apprentices embarked on what seemed to them a jolly social experiment. It entailed altering this country's ethno-cultural makeup along with its institutions and ethos. Canada's brave new progressive liberal socialist mandarins devised on a three-step program to revamp the country culturally and demographically. It involved a reducing immigration from traditional, read Western European sources, b increasing it from non-traditional sources, and c dismantling conservative prime minister until 1963, John Diefenbaker's ideal society of unhyphenated Canadians and replacing it with a Trudeaucratic liberalism's ideal of a multicultural Canada. All right, John Ibbotson, so we're going through in Canada at the time, demographically undergoing a, a huge change. Immigration from, from new countries, Supriya's family comes in, my family comes in from India. Did the new flag um, have that much to do with how Canadians saw themselves or, or what was the country just changing on its own? Well, of course, first of all, that passage in the National Post is absolute rubbish. Um, 
Uh, it's really quite offensive, uh, to, to be honest. And it also completely ignores reality. There was no immigration uh, of any substance coming from the United Kingdom by the 1960s. The, the British were quite happy staying in the United Kingdom. There were no potato famines forcing the Irish to go across the sea. We had taken in hundreds of thousands uh, and more of displaced persons from Eastern Europe, from Southern Europe, uh, Italy, and Portugal, and, uh, and elsewhere as a result of the dislocations of the Second World War. But again, Europe w was back on its feet. We weren't going to be taking in large numbers of immigrants from, from Europe, um, even if we had wanted to. So if we wanted to carry on bringing in immigrants, if we wanted to remain a pioneer society, which we'd always been, then the only place we were going to get them uh, was from uh, what was then called the Third World. And indeed, I've always argued that Pearson's single greatest achievement was not the flag. It was not even health care, the Canada Pension Plan. It was the point system in which we opened ourselves up to the entire world and said, if you can meet the, you know, the, the language requirements, education requirements, the job requirements, come here. So that now, yes, China and India and the Philippines are our three biggest intake countries. We have successfully integrated all of these people, as I said. And to suggest that somehow this was some Marxist socialist experiment that has destroyed you know, the, the essence of the country is just... Rubbish. <laughs> Andrew. But had you listened to John Diefenbaker then, John's absolutely right. Had you listened to John Diefenbaker uh, in 1964, you would have, you would have, that would have been the view. John Diefenbaker railed against the uh, the removal of the so-called Christian elements on the flag. He railed against the detachment from our so-called British past, and so uh, and and was firmly on the wrong side of history then. Um, so uh, uh, that was, though, for Canada um, and Pearson, what the way forward was. And John is right when he talks about uh, Pearson's embrace of open immigration. But it wasn't just that. It was a whole sense that we were moving on, that we were becoming a bicultural, bilingual mm -hmm. country. Of course, then it would become multicultural. And that we, Pearson was much better at pivoting, seeing where we were and where we might go and understanding his Canada. And he was an Anglophile. He had gone to school in Oxford. He had fought in, um, in, in, in the First World War under the Red Ensign, which was why he was booed um, at that convention uh, uh, um, in 1964. Mm -hmm. He was able to see very clearly where this country was going, and the flag was a way of, of, of simply reflecting that. It wasn't the only symbol, but it was simply a way of reflecting a departure from our deeply British past. Okay, Supriya, let me ask you this one. Do you feel any connection? I mean, here we are talking about Canada's imperial past. Do you feel any connection to that? To the imperial past? Yeah. Absolutely not. No. And in fact, I am grateful that we no longer really have it to the same degree. Because, I mean, had it not been for the opening up of immigration, I wouldn't be here today. And neither would you, quite frankly, right? So the, the fact that the National Post would run an article essentially denigrating um, our, our open immigration system and the point system, I find it incredibly offensive. Um, and, you know, call it what it is. We opened it up to non-white uh, immigrants, and that inevitably ended up being a good thing. Mm. Um, as, as John Ibbotson pointed out, um, we weren't bringing in uh, immigrants from the UK anymore, so we, we needed to open up our borders to the other, such as you and I, and <laughs> it ended up working out quite well. Yes, it did, for both you and if I. If I do say so myself, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, I want to read another quotation. We've got a couple to go through as, as the program progresses, but let me bring this one up. Here we go. Uh, this is from rabble.ca, written... Uh, well, October 2013. Here's what it was written. Wandering Canadian baby boomers and Jane Xers of yesteryear knew that traveling around the globe was a lot easier for us than it was for our American brethren. This was undoubtedly the result of our good standing throughout the world and our reputation as a sane and progressive country on almost all issues, both international and domestic. Many of us who have traveled around other countries considered it wise to sew a Canadian flag on our backpacks and show it prominently. I'm going to give you full disclosure here. I've traveled the world many, you know, took a year off and did all that. I've never once sewn a Canadian flag on my backpack. So that's, I'm being totally transparent. I want to ask all, all, all of you. If you had a backpack. If I, I did have a backpack. I didn't sew one on. You can read into that what you will. But Margaret, <laughs> let me come to you today. Is that still tr true today? You worked overseas. I mean, is that still the, the, you know, the sort of image that people have of us and we have of ourselves? Well, I don't know that it's quite as as prominent as it was. Certainly, when I was backpacking around Europe in the in the 70s and early 80s, uh, I did have a Canadian flag. I didn't actually sew it on; it already came pre-sewn on my backpack. <laughs> um, 
But, um, and, and my husband, who happens to be an American, confesses that in the early 70s, when he was backpacking around Europe, he, act, he and his colleague uh, sewed Canadian flags on their backpacks. Um, but it's, um, I, I think it's something that is almost taken for granted now. It, it's not the novelty that was in the 60s or 70s, uh, because it's just, it's Canada's flag. It's, it's, it's just there. It, it's not something new. It's not something novel. It's not something uh, particularly uh, unusual anymore. It's, it's everywhere. And I think with a lot of Canadians who, who either were born after 1965 or who came here, as you did, after 1965, um, this is just the flag they have. And, and it's, it's, it hasn't got that cachet that it used to have. Supriya, mm -hmm. you ever put a flag on your backpack or your suitcase? No, I'm I'm kind of like you. You know, I've, I've I've been around, but I've never really done that either. Mm. I, I don't know if I don't want to. Is it ruin, deliberate? I, I don't. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I don't want to ruin my own luggage by, <laughs> by by sewing into it or, or what. But I I don't think I ever have. I do, however, make a point of wearing uh, some sort of Canadian paraphernalia, especially if I'm in like what, like a, a root sweatshirt, like a root sweatshirt, like a McGill sweatshirt, like a Canada hockey toque if it's cold out, something to that effect. I I, I do like um, Europeans to know that I'm not American. Uh, you do. You get, tend to get a little better service. People are all of a sudden a little bit nicer to you. Um, so it's more that I'd like people to know that I'm not American so much as I'm Canadian, if that makes any sense. Makes perfect sense. John Ibbotson, let me ask you to pick up on that point, because what does it say that we still need to wear something to say we're Canadian when we're abroad, and to distinguish ourselves perhaps from Americans, or just to say we're Canadian? What does that say to you? Well, I think it, it speaks to a latent anti-Americanism that runs through us, and which I find one of the most unpleasant um, and disquieting uh, qualities of our nationalism, to be honest with you. Um, this notion that we needed to have a Canadian flag because otherwise people might mistake us for Americans, and God forbid, because the Americans were ugly and disliked around the world, and frankly, rather disliked here as well, um, was, was a, again, I thought, a, a ridiculous notion. I was very proud to be part of the Western Alliance when I backpacked across Europe. I did have a a, a Canadian flag, but again, it came with the backpack. Um, and I was happy to, to stand up for the Americans to say that the Europeans, but for the presence of American troops, would be Russian citizens by now. So um, I, I, this aspect, frankly, I, I've always found just a, a little bit silly. Um, and uh, again, it just reflects a very unpleasant aspect of our, of our nationalism, this notion that we're not Yanks. Fen, where are you on this one? This, this, you know, we're not a flag-waving country, as, as uh, Andrew pointed out earlier, but we do tend to wear some kind of Canadian identity symbol, notably the flag, when we're out there. Well, I think what's what's interesting is that uh, you know Canadians don't have to wear flags to be appreciated, uh, Pia. Uh, there was a, a poll that was done a little uh, over a year ago by the uh, British Broadcasting Corporation, asking. Uh, people in 25 countries, this was a major global survey of uh, public attitudes, you know, who are the most influential, which are the most influential countries in the world? Um, Germany, a country uh, twice the size of Canada in terms of GNP population, uh, came out at the top. Guess who was number two? Canada. Canada. And uh, we'd actually gone up in the ratings uh, compared to uh, uh, a similar poll taken uh, by the BBC a few years earlier. People know uh, what Canada is. They know what Canada stands for. We have an excellent global reputation. And so I think, uh, you know, to come back to John's point about uh, uh, self-confidence, uh, you know, part of Canadian self-confidence comes from the fact that they realize that we're recognized in the world. People know what we stand for. Margaret, you said your husband's American, so you, you, know, you guys could run a little experiment of your own all these years. When you guys were abroad, was he treated differently than you, given that he was American and you were Canadian? Well, I don't know necessarily that he was treated differently. I mean, obviously, depending on what country you're in, um, Americans sometimes have a, uh, a stronger presence than others. Um, but certainly, we, we, we ran in both circles. We, we were with both the Canadian, uh, Canadian community and the American community. Um, I, I will. I, w I can say that uh, in extraordinary circumstances. And for example, we were in Tunisia uh, during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. 
uh, back in, you know, in 1989, 90, uh, 91. And um, as a Canadian working at the embassy there, at the Canadian embassy, um, if I was walking around the streets of Tunis uh, with one of my colleagues and speaking French, we were largely left alone. But if I was walking around the streets uh, with, say, one of my American colleagues or with my future husband, uh, and we were speaking English, we would be harassed because it was assumed that we were American. Um, and I found that extremely interesting, that just uh, even the linguistic uh, differentiation um, was, uh, was quite pronounced. Um, people who were speaking English on the streets of Tunis at that time um, were, w would be assaulted, uh, spat at, and so on. So it was because it was assumed that you were American. Um, so, uh, I mean, obviously that's an extraordinary example and, and not one that one would necessarily uh, run into today on the streets of Paris, for example, or on the streets of, of Rome. But it, it, is, uh, it is certainly uh, a, a very telling example of, at that time, uh, what international attitudes were. And, and, I, and I think, Andrew, that we, we still suck. It's depending on where you go in the world. You might prominently say you're Canadian or, or, or wear a flag, flag or something. There's other places you might be a little more quiet about it. John Ibbotson brings up the point that he just, you know, just gets them when people want to wear a flag or some Canadian thing to, to say we're not American. Do you think we do that because we, I don't know, have an inferiority complex or is it because we have a moral superiority? Um, maybe they're the flip side of a coin. Uh, we, uh, as I said earlier, we, we have become much more comfortable with symbols, but for years we weren't flag wearers. It was the Americans who brought out the bunting and the stars and stripes and wore it and set it and, um, and Uncle Sam and all that, and we weren't people who did that. We're, we're more comfortable with it now. Um, we do wave the flag in, in many, many places. Um, are we less, uh, is it inferiority complex? I, I think we're outgrowing that. I, I think that we are. And, and this is now almost conventional wisdom, a more comfortable people with who we are. We weren't in the 60s. Um, we have a, a growing culture. We, we've always had sports supremacy, particularly in winter sports. We're happy about that. Own the podium, although it seemed to violate our, our, our natural reserve, was an assertion that, we, that, that struck some people as odd. We're much more willing to do that today. Mm -hmm. The danger is to become swaggering. And, and I think what we're recovering from, frankly, is a foreign minister who really was a megaphone diplomat and who was given to hectoring and lecturing from international platforms, which uh, was outside the norm, probably, of, of Canadians. And you had to wonder if there was much substance uh, around it. Okay. But that, too, was new for us. Okay, we're going to talk about foreign policy and, and what our former foreign ministers have, have been doing um, with all this. But, uh, John Blackwell, you want it in here. Um, I, I, I agree that it, it's... It's, it's a lot more self-confidence 50 years after the fact, but I think Canadians are also much more sophisticated than they were 50 years ago. I live in a very small university town. We have students and faculty from all over the world. People are very mobile and connected. Um, it's a very different world. Okay. Um Andrew, let me come back to you because uh, you just sort of sort of gave a nod to it there. I want to talk about foreign policy. So many Canadians took pride in that good standing um, that was reflected in, in Pearson himself. Just take us back. What was Pearson's foreign policy all about? What was the ethos of it? Well, Pearson's foreign policy was what was called liberal with a small L, though some people might have called it a big L, internationalism. We were then considered, uh, we had emerged from the Second World War um, in, a, in very good shape. We're the fourth largest military power. Uh, we used that, we leveraged that in the 50s with a very sophisticated uh, uh, foreign service, which in 1959, a rising senator named John Fitzgerald Kennedy called perhaps the best in the world. We were very good at using what resources we had. Peacekeeping was part of what we did. It was never all of what we did, even a majority of what we did. We were deeply in the Atlantic Alliance. NATO was very much uh, um, uh, a Pearson's creation. In fact, he said it was his greatest achievement, the Atlantic Alliance. So we weren't just peacekeepers, but we had a sense. We had a military which was uh, defined or called the best small army in the world. Um, we were uh, among the world's uh, uh, early aid givers. Uh, our presence, that was the, the, the Canada that Pearson 
represented. And his intervention, the Suez Crisis in 1956, when he won the Nobel Peace, uh, Peace Prize, gave us that uh, patina, I suppose. We always overstated what peacekeeping was, mm. but that was very much how we saw ourselves, the helpful fixer, the honest broker, uh, the country that was willing to do that, which believed in international institutions, particularly the United Nations. Okay, that was then. That was then. Uh, let's talk about now. I want to read um, something that John Ibbotson wrote uh, in the Globe uh, last year. Here we go, John. We're going to read what you wrote. Stephen Harper has discarded decades of liberal and progressive conservative foreign policy conventions. Canada, under the Conservatives, has reduced its role in multilateral forums such as the United Nations and the Commonwealth. The Canadian reputation for even-handedness has given way to a stout defense of democracy in the face of possible aggression, whether in Israel or Ukraine. Humanitarian aid has become economic development aid. Trade has become the top priority at foreign affairs. And on Mr. Harper's watch, Canada abandoned its Kyoto commitment to combat climate change. John Ibbotson, you want to add anything to that? No, that's not a bad listing. It's, uh, it's simply a question of whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, Andrew uh, described the, the Personian tradition that we uh, that we like to think we inherited. But Andrew also wrote a wonderful book back in 2004 called Wild Canada Slept, How We Lost Our Way in the World, I think it was, Andrew. Um, because, because by 2004, uh, the Personian tradition had, be, had become hypocritical. We weren't doing any peacekeeping anymore. Our army had become a joke. Uh, we no longer spoke with any authority in the councils of power. We had become what I called incoherent in, in our foreign policy, espousing uh, one set of principles, but in fact um, not, not living up to them ourselves. The Conservatives have changed that. They have made the foreign policy far more muscular, uh, louder, there's no question about that, um, much more aggressive and assertive. They also have, however, some pretty impressive accomplishments to put beside that, especially the big trade agreement with the European Union, uh, with Korea, our involvement in Afghanistan, our leadership in the, um, the, the mission uh, in Libya, our, um, the incredible work that Canadians did in Haiti af after the, uh, the earthquake. But you'll find, I suspect, if you ask some of the people at this table, that others think that this is a vulgar and Philistine tradition that we are now embracing under the Conservatives. I don't myself, but I know that that perception is out there. Let us do just that and, and go around the table on uh, Stephen Harper's foreign policy and what drives it. Andrew, go ahead. Well, we've just uh, seen the departure of, uh, of, the, of John Baird, who I call the mogul of the megaphone. His was um, uh, 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 diplomacy which was uh, on steroids. Uh, that is the expression of the, of, of the Canadian um, view in the world, which in his case was democracy um, and human rights and um, principle. We, we would hear a lot of the word principle before John Baird's name. But John Baird was inconsistent on human rights. I mean, there was human rights uh, that he attacked in Myanmar and, and, and Iran, but not in other parts of the Arab world, uh, and certainly not China. And what his cabinet colleague, Jason Kennedy, uh, Jason Kenney, would be foreign minister today had he not been uh, less clear on his opposition to what was happening in China. And he goes back, his champion of human rights in China goes back to his time in opposition, and it made him ineligible to be mm. our foreign minister. So we've seen a foreign policy which has been loud, aggressive. Um, I'm not so sure it's achieved a lot. We've, um, in a sense, uh, withdrawn, or certainly from uh, covenants, conventions at the UN. We did not mount a spirited uh, effort to retain the seat. Uh, the rotating seat we had taken on the Security Council every year since the creation of the Security Council in 1945. Um, my sense is this was uh, the diplomacy um, uh, uh, that was all about speaking and less about acting. All right, Fenn, was it just um, you know, being aggressive and muscular or what, what's behind St um, Stephen Harper's foreign policy? Well, Pia, I think uh, one, one is certainly struck by the fact that um, as uh, one listens to the debates about where Canada is or should be going in the world. It's very much like those debates we had uh, about the flag, those who want uh, the flag to have everything in it, uh, or those who want uh, a more economical expression of foreign policy. And I think, uh, you know, to be, to be fair to the government, um, you know, uh, uh, it hasn't been a, a perfect ride uh, by, by any means, but you know, when it comes to multilateral institutions, Pia, they're in big trouble. We saw that in the response of uh, the World Health Organization to the Ebola crisis. 
Uh, we've seen that uh, in the return of the UN Security Council to, uh, to deadlock. They've been talking about reform of the Security Council now for the better part of 25 years. Nothing has happened. And um, I'm quite struck by the fact that um, uh, you know, when you talk to foreign leaders or when you hear foreign leaders uh, you know, talk about Canada, I mean, Kevin Rudd, uh, Labor uh, Prime Minister, Labor uh, Foreign Minister, uh, a very uh, prominent uh, capital L liberal on the global stage. Um, he, referred, he referred to John Baird as a pragmatic internationalist, uh, somebody who uh, didn't believe in more seminars but in action. And he, in fact, invited uh, John Baird to uh, join him as co-chair uh, to uh, chair a new global commission on the future of multilateralism, which is looking at ways to make the UN better. And it's a myth to say that this government turned its back on the UN. We're still the seventh largest uh, contributor. But uh, we've been much more pragmatic, I think it's fair to say, in terms of uh, you know, not looking at the UN through the rose-colored glasses of uh, a bygone era. It's a very different world today. And as John said, it, it's a much more muscular foreign policy. Uh, you know, we've gone through the world's biggest economic crisis. It's one of the reasons why economics has been front and center. You can't do everything. And so, you know, this is a government that has also focused on trying to diversify Canada's markets at a time when, uh, you know, quite frankly, we're losing market share in the United States. U.S. growth, as it's come back, is not going to lift our boat. All right, Supriya, lots to unpack there. I mean, there are people, Canadians, who say, you know, harken back to the Pearsonian peacekeeping image and say that, that that's the, the true Canada, not this Canada that we're sort of living in now. Do you think we can go back to reclaiming the mantle if that's what we want, or is this just time has moved on and this is how we identify ourselves now? I, I think we can if that's what you want, but I think you hit the nail on the head right there. Is that, is that something that we want to go back to? Do we want to go back if those are in fact our roots and is that how we identify ourselves as Canadians and as our foreign policy? I think it's really interesting that we keep referring to Stephen Harper's foreign policy as muscular and not so much as inconsistent because I think Andrew really made a good point here is that all our hu human rights and, and pushing of democracy, if you will, has been quite selective. Um, whether it's China, whether it's Saudi Arabia, um, we, we tend to tiptoe around, uh, the perfect example is I ISIS versus Saudi Arabia. Granted, uh, Saudi Arabia is not trying to expand its territory, but when you're talking about actual atrocities committed between the two, you know, organizations side by side, they're quite similar. Um, and yet here we are, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, all um, lamenting an, the, the death of, of the f former Saudi king and, and, and lauding his achievements as a, as a moderate reformer, and which is absolute nonsense. So I think it's interesting for, for me as, as a millennial to come up having seen everybody referring to the, the Pearson era, but I would refer to it as a Chrétien era of, of foreign policy because that's what I know. Um, and, and I miss it. I, I, I miss those days of having you know a, a seat on the UN Security Council. I miss the days of, of standing for, for principles and, and not just for muscle and, and loudness for the sake of, of being heard. Hmm. Okay, John Ibbotson, there you are uh, in Ottawa. You know, everyone's looking at the calendar. When's this election going to be called? We're in election year, whether it happens in the spring or the fall. Do we vote? I mean, we talk about foreign policy, and those of us who care about it, you know, talk about it probably more than others who, who don't. But do Canadians vote on foreign policy? They haven't much in the past. I think they might this time. By the way, the election is in the fall, and anyone who tells you it might be in the spring is being silly. Um, it's an October 19th date. Put it on your calendar. Thank you, John. Um, I think we have, I think we have a, a split, and you're hearing it on this panel, between those who think that um, the conservative foreign policy more accurately reflects the world that we live in today uh, with its emphasis on uh, new economic ties, uh, with, uh, I agree, a selective emphasis on human rights, um, uh, and, and that all in all, the Personian tradition is, a, a, or the Kretschian tradition, if you want to call it that, is a, is a lost tradition that we couldn't get back if we wanted to and probably don't want to, versus those who do want to go back to that, who do think that Canada has lost its way in the world, that Canada has gone missing. Uh, I think we see it reflected in the opposition of the Liberal and New Democratic parties uh, to the mission in Iraq. Uh, a clear split between the Conservatives and the other guys on, on that particular mission. Although I would contend that on all the other big stuff, they're, they're actually singing from the same songbook. So I think for the first time since 1988, the, the free trade election, we may in fact have an, a robust debate about what Canada should be doing in the war on terror, whether we should be emphasizing human rights or trade with China, uh, whether we should be expanding into the Pacific.
Pacific, because I think there's going to be a trade agreement with the Trans-Pacific Partnership before the next election. Uh, we may actually be, for once, debating foreign policy, and which is actually a, a good thing. Uh, John is right, but the mission uh, in, in, in Iraq is an example of the hollowness of Canadian foreign policy today. Here you have the, the government calling ISIS the greatest existential threat to Christendom and all of us, um, probably in a millennium. And what are we doing to oppose it? We're dispatching, a sense, six aging aircraft and some people on the ground, um, and that's dealing with this threat with a peace shooter. And that's the trouble with our rhetoric. We, we, uh, fill ourselves up in our jumped up uh, sense of, of the world and we swagger international platforms and at the end of the day we don't do a lot. I'm not saying we don't sign trade agreements, we do. I'm not saying we haven't done things at the UN and maternal uh, uh, care, but when it comes to these big questions we're really a lot of talk and not a lot of action. Finn, um, election year, I don't know when you think this election will, will be, but do you think, um, as uh, John Ibbotson suggests, that maybe for the first time in a long time foreign policy is going to be a defining issue? I, I, I would put it slightly differently. I think, uh, uh, you know, the election will be fought uh, on, uh, on the economy and the health of the Canadian economy and whether the government have been seen to be uh, stewards of it, uh, effective stewards of it or not. Um, but I think where foreign policy is important, and we're seeing it in the context of, uh, uh, you know, the debate about what we're doing in, in Iraq, um, is that uh, it's, it's being used as a wedge issue. Uh, you know, for those uh, who believe that you know, Canada should be muscular, we should be contributing to this uh, fight against ISIS, um, you know, the government uh, has, has, has played it right. Uh, you have uh, a clear alternative in the position of the uh, New Democratic Party, Thomas Malclair, who says uh, we shouldn't uh, be there. You know, when it comes to uh, Mr. Trudeau, um, you know, it's not really clear where the Liberals stand uh, on, on, on the issue. And I think, um, you know, that has been part of the effective uh, positioning uh, of this government. Um, you know, will, will it be the deciding factor uh, when people actually go into that ballot box, Pia? I don't think so. I don't think so. People are going to be looking at their wallets and they're going to be saying to themselves, Have I, am, am I better off or, or uh, you know, is, is my employment uh, insured under the Conservatives? Fair enough. Um, we began our conversation talking about the flag uh, and, and the anniversary that's coming up on Sunday. And Margaret, let me come to you. We've seen the, the, the Harper government um, celebrate anniversaries of the War of 1812, uh, John A. Macdonald's uh, 200th um, anniversary this year, birthday. Um, what's it doing on Sunday to mark the 50th anniversary of our flag? Well, of course, I, I'm not, I don't work for the government. I don't work for the Harper government or for Canadian Heritage, but um, they are having a ceremony here in Ottawa uh, at Confederation Park, um, and I've been assured that there will be, you know, some hoopla, uh, and they've been sending out promotional material. I do think that it is uh, a lost opportunity to really kick off the build-up to our 150th anniversary of, of Confederation. Uh, it's a lost opportunity to really kick that off with a, with a bang. Um, I think that there's a, a, a very unfortunate tendency uh, to, uh, and I agree with when Andrew wrote in his column recently about a ten, we're seeing a tendency towards conservative history and liberal history. And I, 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 I find that a very unfortunate trend. I, I, I would like that to become just Canadian history and, and leave the politics out of it as much as we can, uh, except, of course, the parts of history that are political. So, uh, but I think, I think it's, it's important that we, that we celebrate this. Okay, if it's, it's important to Margaret, Andrew, why isn't the government doing more come this Sunday? Margaret, Margaret is being very generous. Let's, let's be clear on this. The government of Canada is doing nothing, almost nothing, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the flag, as it did nothing on the 30th anniversary of the patriation of the Constitution and the entrenchment of the Charter of, of, uh, of Rights. Nothing. It's allocated $50,000 through the Department of Heritage. By way of comparison, $28 million or more went to celebrate the War of 1812. Uh, $4 million uh, went to the 
commemoration of the 200th birthday of Sir John A. Macdonald. A million and a half dollars went to commemorate a famine in Ukraine, and I'm not in any way disparaging the famine and the suffering. $50,000, and there's a reason for this, Pia. The reason is the Conservatives do not want to be reminded of where they were on this issue 50 years ago. It is true the Liberals are using in their fundraising the Maple Leaf, and there will be a ceremony on Parliament Hill on, on, um, on Sunday, largely organized by Maurice Belanger, the uh, Member of Parliament from Ottawa Vanier, um, who will have a ceremony there. The government itself will not have a ceremony. It has gone out of its way, in a sense, to ignore this, disparage it, simply that it does not exist. John Blackwell, I got about 30 seconds left. Do you see our flag as a liberal flag? I see it as a Canadian flag. Um, many people have disparaged it because it happens to have liberal colors. Um, but I, I regard it as a totally Canadian flag. Red and white are the Canadian colors. Uh, one of the things that George Stanley did not want was a red, white, and blue flag. He did not want it to be British. He did not want it to be American. All right. Thank you, all six of you. Good conversation tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks, Pia. Thank you, Pia. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Pia. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.